Good evening and welcome to the 2021 Georgia Cumberland Conference camp meeting, a virtual camp meeting that is. We're glad that you've joined us. We hope that these evenings together will be a blessing to you and to your family as we consider God's blessing on us and our conference. The theme that we've chosen not only for this week's camp meeting, but also for the coming year is the, is the theme, Great Things He Has Done. You're familiar with that phrase, perhaps from the hymn, to God be the glory, great things he has done. And we want to praise God for the ways that he has blessed the Georgia Cumberland Conference, our members, our churches, our schools, and the conference itself as we have uh, experienced the last year. The pandemic, the the challenges that we have all faced, uh, we thank God that he has been with us. So as we uh, consider the Word of God tonight, we're going to be looking at Jehoshaphat's principle. The principle that allows, allowed him and allows us today to rejoice and to praise God and to worship Him when things are going well, but also when things aren't going so well. This evening we're going to have a mission story, we're going to have special music, and then we're, we're going to come back and we're going to study this story from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Hi, I'm Gary Wagner, and I'd like to tell you a mission story that comes from the Congo in 1992. I was the mission president and the ADRA director in the Congo, and one of the responsibilities that I had there was to find ways that ADRA could help the people. You see, they had just come out of 13 years of communism, and the church had been closed during all of that time, so we were trying to reopen the church. But another thing we wanted to do was to help the people in the countryside because agriculture had been shut down during that 13 years. And instead of being a, a, a self-supporting, exporting country, they were importing food to feed the people. So we wanted to do what we could. I, I arranged with a man at the U.S. Embassy uh, who was uh, f- from Congo, to help me uh, make some appointments up country in, into the Congo so that we could talk to different village chiefs and, and talk to other people about uh, the possibilities of putting in water wells or helping get the roads ready f- so that they could transport crops back down to the capital city and export them and... and uh, So there were a lot of things that we had as possibilities. This man couldn't go with me himself, but he had a a son who he volunteered to go along. Interestingly enough, because because the country of the Congo had been closed by the communists uh, for 13 years, it meant the church that had been there had also been closed. Uh, It had not been permitted to function, and we had lost all of our buildings. So we really didn't have very many people there who who could help me to go into different parts of the country. Uh, We we were able to find a handful of of members who who still wanted to remain uh, as Seventh-day Adventists. But I had to go to somebody else to help me with uh, with this trip. So we began our trip in my, in my pickup, my missionary pickup, and we started driving north on uh, uh, National Highway Number 2 uh, to the north part of the Congo. The highway was good for about 10 miles, and, and then it got to where we had to drive off of the highway because that was better than driving on the highway. Uh, the, the potholes were bigger than the truck was, so we couldn't miss them. We had to just drive off of the highway. Now, we had an appointment at the end of the day to stay at the governor's mansion in one of the, one of the districts. And as we approached the governor's mansion, uh, after a long day's drive, the, the man, I'll call him Daniel, who was with me said, now, uh, I don't really know if he's going to be here, but, but if we missed him, he said, just go on into the mansion and, and make yourself at home. And so I had grand thoughts. Wow, that must be really something to just leave the governor's mansion to somebody you don't even know and just tell him to have the free reign of the place. So we arrived at the, at the mansion and 
it wasn't really what I might call a mansion. But there was a house that at one time maybe had been a nice place, but there weren't any windows in it. They had all been broken out. And there weren't any doors in it. They had all been removed. And <clears throat> when we looked for the restroom facilities, there was, a, there was a row of outhouses in the back of the house. But there was no one there. And so Daniel said to me, well, I've made arrangements to sleep somewhere else. So you'll be here in the governor's mansion alone tonight. Well, that wasn't a real, uh, I wasn't very eager to do that, but as he was explaining it to me, he was getting into my truck and driving away. So there I was, all alone. I had no idea where, and nobody else had any idea where I was either. And my truck was driving away. I didn't know if I'd ever see it again. So <clears throat> I went into the house, into the place, there was one room on the ground floor that had a bed in it. And it was a Western style bed. It was covered with all kinds of something kind of dirt. And it was getting dark and I didn't really know what that was. So I brushed off what I could. And, and as it was getting too dark to see anything, I took my boots off and put them at the end of the bed and hoped that they would be there in the morning. And turned around with my back towards the bed and carefully sat down and laid down on my back on the bed. I thought, this is the place that God has given me to rest tonight. This will be a good place to rest. I have to admit, I slept pretty well. But when the sunlight coming through the non-window struck my eyes and it woke me up, I looked around the room and, and recognized that all around the room at the edge of the ceiling and the walls were bats that were just hanging there and watching me wake up. And then I knew what was on the bed that I was sleeping on. So I got up and brushed myself off and started putting my boots on. And I decided, well, let me just wait a moment. Uh, I've heard of places where things crawl in your boots. So I turned them upside down and beat them together. And sure enough, a scorpion came uh, falling out of one of my boots. Well, I put both boots on and went out to the outhouse. And then I waited and waited and waited for my pickup to come back. Finally, it did. And uh, Daniel had found the place that he was uh, staying, and he had had a nice breakfast, but I hadn't had any breakfast. But we got on the road and started driving. And, and as we were driving, we came to a place where there was a Y. Now, I wouldn't call it a road because it wasn't a road anymore. The highway had disappeared long before that. And, and, and now we were on uh, a, a place where there was two paths going off in different directions. And he turned, Daniel turned to me and said, if we if we take this, the left path, then we will get to the village that we're supposed to go to in time to meet with another uh, provincial governor to talk with him about your projects. And I said, what happens if we go the other way? Well, that will take two days for us to get there, and I'm not sure we'll be able to, to, to catch him. So we took the one-day trail. As we drove along through the one-day trail, uh, it was uh, fascinating to be able to be in, in a part of Africa that uh, very, very few foreigners ever went to. And, and it was, of course, a beautiful place. And I enjoyed driving through it on the, uh, on the, the left trail. Finally, we came to a bridge. This bridge at one time had, uh, had been a, a very good, strong bridge. It was about 120 feet long, and, and it had metal supports. And you could tell it had been built very well. The problem with the bridge, though, was at some point along the way, people had taken off the, 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 the wooden 
cover to the bridge that you're supposed to drive on. And all that was there was some logs. I asked, well, how do we get across? Well, Daniel went and asked the village people that were on either side of the bridge, who kind of controlled the bridge, and, and he found that at some point along the way during those last 13 years, the, uh, the people needed firewood, and so they, they would take off that, those big lumbers and, and just uh, burn them. And now the logging trucks had begun coming through again, so the logging trucks had taken big 18-inch uh, logs and, and s smoothed off the top and the bottom and put those across the metal beams. Each metal beam was, was uh, just a little farther apart than my truck was long. And so he said, the trucks go across these, so we can too. And I looked at it and thought, well, I'm glad the trucks go across this. When was the last time they did? Oh, it's been a long time. So we decided, if trucks go across it, then we can too, because we don't have three days to go back one day and then go the other way two days, because surely we'll miss the governor that we're supposed to meet this evening. I began developing a plan for going across the bridge. We would measure the, the the distance between the tires on my truck, and we would then measure, of course we had to do it with a stick because we didn't have a tape, or a tape measure, and we would take that stick and, and, and measure to the center of the logs and move them so that they would uh, be far enough apart because since there was a gap between each metal uh, brace, that was longer than my, car, my truck, if I began to drive off of one of those, or if, if one of them just tipped and threw me off, then I would immediately be down in the ravine 40 feet below in the white water. I started praying a lot uh, at that time because uh, it, it felt like maybe I should take the other route, but I didn't want to miss my appointment. I started thinking this will make great video to show to my family once I'm done. And I had a video camera with me, but then I thought, well, if I put the video camera on the dash here and I'm filming this, then if something happens and it starts to slide, if I jerk at all to try to catch the video camera, then, then I might drive off of the logs. So I put the video camera away. And then I got to thinking, well, maybe I could video it before and after. And then I got to thinking even more. I said, well, that would be an issue of pride now to be able to show that bridge from both sides that I had gotten across. And that pride might be just enough to keep me from making right decisions. So I just put the camera away altogether. I said to Daniel, who spoke his own local language, and we were conversing in French, but my French wasn't very good. So how do I devise a, a method so that he could stand forward and show me how to drives because when you get to the end of one log, they have to be put side by side at the ends so that you then have to drive over onto the next log. And what if the back wheels don't follow exactly where the front wheels went? So I asked Daniel, put your hands in front of you at about this height and never take them away from there until I'm on the other side. And if, if I need to go forward, then put your hands up. But if I need to stop, then put your hands down. And if I need to move 
to your left, put your hands this way. And if I need to move to the right, put your hands this way. And I will watch ahead. I asked Daniel to get in the middle of the bridge and, and guide me the first part of the way. And then after that, the plan was to put him at the other end of the bridge to guide the rest of the way. <clears throat> the thing is, Daniel and I had been building trust along that trip. Even though he had driven off with my truck and I didn't know where he was going, when I got back in that morning, I decided not to say anything about it. And that was probably a good thing because we didn't have that little bit of edginess to, to deal with. So Daniel stood in the right place and the villagers started building up in number over on the other side of the bridge. I could tell they would like to see that foreigner drive his truck off the, off the bridge. Well, at least that's what my thought was. So Daniel started giving the instructions and I prayed again and I began going slowly as he pointed me to just where to go and when to go and how fast to go and when to stop so that, so that we could go across. At the, first, at the first change of logs where the next set of logs was placed, it was the, the big test. Would we be able to accomplish this? And, and after getting past that first interchange, I stopped and prayed. Thank you, God, for getting me this far. And so I drove slowly again to the next interchange, and of course I had to go the opposite direction to get across that one. And when we got to the center, there were, there were seven different interchanges where we had to turn from one set of logs to another. It took a long time to drive across that bridge. It's worse than rush hour traffic on the interstate coming into uh, Chattanooga from Atlanta. But finally, on the other side, I was on the ground. I have to say that my, my, first, my first pronouncement to myself was, thank you, God, for bringing me through. And then, thank you, God, for overcoming my foolishness in even trying to do this. And thank you, God, for giving me another chance to meet with the governor. We got to the village where the governor was supposed to meet us, and he wasn't there. So we spent a night at that village and then decided to turn around and, and head back. When Daniel asked me, you want to do the bridge again, or shall we go the two-day route? I told him, let's take the two-day route. God was very willing to lead and protect. But I think he also expects us to be a little more thoughtful and think about what he's trying to lead us for. Exodus chapter 13, verse 21 and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and by night. Now God uses a lot of ways to lead us to live for him. And we're to be wise to follow him in every little detail. That one part of my life for that half hour that it took to drive across that bridge, I recognized the, the importance of following God's direction with every tiny detail. God's trying to lead your life too, and he has all the detail you need to show you how to get across the bridge and to the other side. Jesus is coming soon, and he's telling you now how he will help you to get there. Hope you follow. Meet you there. 
As we recount the great things that God has done, two miracles come to mind. It's the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 found in Matthew chapter 14 and 15. It must have been awesome to witness these great things from the perspective of the disciples. I know I would have loved to get a front row seat to see God do these great things. Personally, looking over my life, it amazes me to see the great things that God has been able to do with the little that I've been able to offer. It reminds me of the promise found in John chapter 14, verse 12. And it says something like this, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. What Jesus is implying is that his earthly example will be our guide to do even greater things. But for these greater things to happen, it's going to take more giving of our time, talents, and resources to the Lord. So let me challenge you to consider giving an even greater portion of your resources so that God can do even greater things amongst us and through us. Now you can prayerfully give your special offerings for evangelism conference-wide in three ways. You can give directly on our conference website at gccsda.com. Or secondly, you can send a check via the Postal Service to our conference. And if you do, please indicate on the check that it is for conference evangelism. And a third way that you can give is through your local church. And again, if you choose to do so, please clearly indicate that it is for conference evangelism. Here's to looking forward to greater things that God will do. Let me pray with you now. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to witness great things before us. Lord, we expect and are anxious for greater things to happen. So please allow us to surrender even more of what you have given us so that we can see you working through us for the benefit of those that need to hear your word of salvation for today. This we thank you and ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Good evening and welcome again. We're going to be looking this evening at Jehoshaphat's principle. We're going to be studying how we can be rejoicing and happy and grateful and thankful no matter what is going on around us. Over and over over the last year, ADCOM has been struck by God's amazing grace, His goodness to us as a conference, to our churches, to our members, to our schools. Now, I know there have been losses. We have, we've had challenges. But yet, as we see the world around us and we see the many challenges that, that other areas are facing, we are, we're just praising God that He has been good to us. You're familiar with the hymn, To God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life, our atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. The theme that we want to echo and re-echo throughout our conference over the next year is praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear His voice. Let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory. Great things He has done. Tonight we're going to be taking a look at that principle we, we find in the story of Jehoshaphat that reveals one of the secrets that allow us to live a power-filled, victorious, joyful Christian life. So open your Bibles with me tonight, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and we're going to get into that story. Through my years of observing people, I have noticed something striking. The happiest people I've known have never been the ones with the least adversity or the greatest advantages. In fact, it seems as though those whose happiness shines the most brilliantly from them are those who have what appears to be the most problems, but who have found a divinely inspired principle of living that leads them to rejoice even in their troubles. Matthew Henry, the, the famous Bible scholar uh, whose name is on his, his commentaries, was once accosted by thieves, and these thieves stole his billfold. In his diary that evening, he wrote these notable words. Let me be thankful. First, because I've never been robbed before. Second, although they took my billfold, they did not take my life. Third, although they took my all, it wasn't very much. And fourth, because it was I that was robbed and not someone else. What leads a person to respond to a life event with that kind of a spirit and that kind of an attitude? What leads a person to live a life of praise and thanksgiving even when faced with adversity? So this evening, I invite you to look with me here in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and we're going to start with the first principle that animated and empowered Jehoshaphat's life and, and his leadership and led him to bring Judah to a great victory. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and we'll begin in verse 1. It says, After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, and with them some of the Munites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. And behold, they are in Hazan Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid. We'll pause right there for a moment. Have you ever been afraid? Have you ever been facing challenges that led you to be fearful, even for your very life, maybe for your career, for your ministry, for your business, for your job? Have you ever faced that kind of a life event where you just didn't know what the future held? Some of you will think back just over a year ago. As the pandemic began to explode around the world, as it went viral, literally, and people were affected, and nobody knew how they would be affected. They didn't know. We didn't know what would happen here in Georgia Cumberland. We didn't know how our schools would, 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 would face this kind of a challenge. We didn't know how our churches would survive, maybe even being closed down for extended periods of time. We didn't know what would happen to our jobs 
to our ability to give and to support God's work here and around the world. There are so many things that we were fearful of, and, and it may not have been last year, maybe there are other experiences that come to your mind. Jehoshaphat heard the news, and he was afraid. One thing I appreciate about the Bible is that it is relatable. You know, these, these heroes of the Bible, they were people just like you and just like me. And Josh, Jehoshaphat was afraid when he heard this news. And the Bible says, then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. The first principle we find that leads a person to be able to face adversity and trials and troubles and even potential loss and loss itself with praise in their heart is the principle of prayer, seeking God's face. You see, Jehoshaphat was afraid. He didn't know what the future held. He didn't know how he should answer, respond to this challenge that he was faced with. And so he sought the Lord. He prayed. And, and it's interesting to me that Jehoshaphat didn't just say, you know, I'm the king of Judah. I am the one responsible, although there were the high priests, of course, the priests, uh, but I'm the one responsible for leading and responding. to. I need to pray. Jehoshaphat did not just say, I need to pray. Jehoshaphat said, let's all gather together and let's pray together. In the Old Testament, we find examples of the, the, the people of God, the church of God, joining in united prayer and praying together for something that faced their cause as a whole. And so Jehoshaphat stands, verse 5 of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat stands in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and this is his prayer. And I want you to just follow along with me as we examine this prayer. It's, it's, it's such an amazing prayer that he prays. He says, O Lord God of our fathers, Are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of the land, of this land, before your people Israel, and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Notice that that Jehoshaphat begins his prayer by extolling God's virtues and his character, his power and his might. And he's reminding God, as if God needed reminding, but he's also reminding the people who are listening around him, listening to his prayer. He's reminding them of God's past leading in their history. Reminds me of the the well-known quotation that you've probably heard says something along the lines of, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we forget the way God has led us and his past dealings with the children of men. And Jehoshaphat here is reminding God, you are a God who is all-powerful. I believe, he's saying, you are still on the throne. You still have might and power. They belong to you, and you are the God who has delivered us in the past. You've provided, you've protected, you've cared for your people. And notice if you skip down with me, we're going to read verse 12. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them, our enemies? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. He confesses his weakness. He's just said, God, you are the God who has all might and all power. All power. You are, you are the all-powerful God who reigns in heaven. But we are weak. We are powerless against this great horde. It's a confession of weakness. And he doesn't just stop with his military weakness or his inability to know how he should respond to this attack by the enemies. He says also, we do not know what to do. Jehoshaphat confesses, we're weak and we don't know what to do. We need your power, your might, your wisdom. What I see here in the prayer of Jehoshaphat is a prayer of submission and confession. And he doesn't end there. The last phrase is perhaps the most beautiful of all. But, he says, but our eyes 
are on you. When we're facing challenging times, there's one place our eyes need to be. They need to be on Jesus. They need to be looking heavenward. And they will be, they will be, if we remember what Jehoshaphat remembered, that all power and might and wisdom and knowledge belongs to God. We are weak. We don't have understanding. We don't know what to do. But our eyes are on the one who has the answers. You know, it was not just a hard economic time that Israel or Judah was facing. It was not just an inconvenience. It was actually their lives were on the line. I wonder, I wonder how we respond when we are faced with challenges. However, that's not the end of the story. There are more principles for us to learn. Four principles we're going to be looking at here. The first one is prayer. Jehoshaphat led his nation to collectively, unitedly pray to the God of heaven. And that prayer is a model prayer, praising and extolling God for his might and his power, his knowledge and his wisdom. It's submitting, confessing our need and saying, we're just going to watch and see what you can do. We are needing your salvation. Meanwhile, verse 13 says, All Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jeel, son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. I'm glad we got that whole genealogy there. The point is, God is going to respond by pouring out His Spirit and speaking through the prophetic gift. And he said, Listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid. Oh, the message of heaven. Whenever God sends a special message, I I love the way the angels always say to those shocked, whether they're shepherds or, or Gideon or Manasseh or whoever it is, do not be afraid. Yes, the message of heaven says, don't be afraid. And do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem." Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them and the Lord will be with you. The second principle that can lead us to living faith-filled, joy-filled, praise-filled lives, even in times of adversity, is the principle of listening to the prophets, listening to God's word. You know, God has blessed us with so much, and, 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 and we sometimes find ourselves, like Jehoshaphat and those of, of Judah, we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place, and we don't know which way to turn. We, we, we need to remember that we don't have wisdom, but God does have wisdom. The Word of the Lord contains the wisdom that He wants to transmit to us. The righteous hear the Word of the Lord and are safe. The word of the Lord is is the beginning of wisdom. It's how we begin to understand. And and Jehoshaphat would underscore this truth, this principle, when he comes a, a little while later and he reminds them that if they will listen to the prophets of God, if they will listen to the words of inspiration, they will be safe. They will prosper. The first principle we see here in the story of Jehoshaphat is the principle of prayer. The second is the principle of the prophets, the word of God. What a blessing we have, the gift of inspiration that he's given to us. Of of all people, we should be the most grateful for the messages that God has given to us because these messages, these pages, the inspired writings, they contain God's will and God's wisdom for us living here also in 2021. Jehoshaphat says, 
the, the Bible says, Jehoshaphat then bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites of the Kohathites and the Korathites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Verse 20, And they went up early in the morning, and they went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. You see, the third principle that we find here is a principle that involves obedience. I was going to use the word positioning because it was, it was literally, for them, obeying was positioning themselves to watch God's deliverance. But, you know, some people might read this and they might say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We, we don't get blessed because we obey, do we? The answer to that question is, yes, we do. We don't get saved because we obey. Don't get me wrong. You notice that there's, there's, there's a sequence, he, even here in this Old Testament story, that is in harmony with what we understand to be the gospel of grace. You understand that here in, in Je Jehoshaphat's prayer, Jehoshaphat has prayed a prayer of consecration, confession, and submission. Our eyes are on you. We can't save ourselves. This is not a, this is not a, 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 a salvation by works prayer that Jehoshaphat has prayed to open this chapter. And even in this message that he delivers to the people of Judah and Jerusalem as they leave to go out into battle early the next morning, even this message, it is a message where the sequence is in harmony with the gospel of grace. Notice what he says here, hear me, Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God. Listen, friends, salvation comes when we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior from sin. Salvation comes when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Romans makes that very clear. And of course, Paul is, is often in Romans quoting the Old Testament. I don't believe there's a, there's a contradiction between the old and the new here. But the book of Romans here, he says in, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, he says, For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, he's quoting now from the Old Testament, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And Je Jehoshaphat here is saying, believe on the Lord your God. Believe on the Lord your God and you will be established. That's where our relationship with God, well, it doesn't begin there because it begins with God searching and, and, and seeking us. But, but our salvation begins when we believe. And we experience the justification Paul's talking about. We experience the salvation that he's talking about here. And then he says in verse, uh, chapter 10 and verse 11, For the scripture says, Everyone who believes on him, in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Brothers and sisters, friends of mine this evening, the Bible is very clear. Salvation doesn't come through our obedience, through our human works. But it also is very clear that our obedience puts us in a position where God can bless us in our walk with Him. The Bible says that Je Jehoshaphat's message was simple. Believe. Believe the Lord your God. You'll be established. Believe His prophets and you will succeed. The only way that Judah could find deliverance from their enemies was in doing what the prophet had said. Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, doing exactly what he said and obeying. It's our privilege, friends, when we have seen the salvation of the Lord to live lives of obedience. Notice the, the, the praise and the worship has already begun. They're already praising God for saving him here in verse 18. Um, Jehoshaphat bows his head and his face to the ground. All Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Why? Because they believed in his salvation. They believed he was going to rescue them from their enemies. They believed that even in this time of, of, of test, even this time of adversity, even when it seemed like they were helpless, 
God was going to be their help. They believed it. They had faith in it. And they obeyed because of it. Verse 21, And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and say, Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. I love this, this man, Jehoshaphat. I mean, he could have said anything in praise to God. He could have sent the choir out there with a chorus that said something along the lines of, Our God is a mighty God. The, you know, he could have had them singing the song of Miriam there by the Red Sea. The chariot and his host is he thrown into the sea, right? Our God is a, a God of war. Our God is a mighty God. Our God is a powerful God. He believed in that God. But here Jehoshaphat sends the choir before the army with one message. Our God is a God of love. His love endures forever. What a message animated Jehoshaphat's life. What a, an understanding of God Jehoshaphat had that allowed him to lead the people of Judah to a time of praise and worship, extolling the virtues of God, but especially the love of God. He believed that his love would be on full display, his love and his salvation. So what are the principles that we're seeing in this story that allow God's people to live victorious, joy-filled, praise-filled lives? First, the principle of prayer, that we seek God when we're in trouble, and we pray prayers not of, you know, we need to tell you what to do, God. We have the answers. But instead, prayers like Jehoshaphat prayed. We don't have the answer, God, but you do. We don't have the power, but you do. We don't have the knowledge or the wisdom, but you do. And our eyes are on you. The principle of prayer through times of adversity. The principle of listening to the prophets, the word of God, the pages of inspiration are there for us to find answers for our dilemmas. The third, the principle of positioning. Placing ourselves in obedience to God's word where he, can obey, where he can bless us and fulfill his promises to us. I'm not talking about obeying so we're going to be saved. I'm talking about obeying because we are saved, and he wants to bless us and fulfill his word to us. The fourth principle is the principle of praise that's on full display in these verses. Verse 22, And when, not before, not after, but when, they began to sing and praise... The Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. What is the secret for victory? It is prayer. It is listening to the prophets. It is positioning ourselves in obedience to His word. It is praise and thanksgiving that allows God to work in our behalf and for Him to receive all the glory and all the praise. You remember our theme for this camp meeting, and indeed for this year, great things he has done. <laughs> the way God delivered his people in Jehoshaphat's time, the way Jehoshaphat led them through this experience of adversity to victory, God received all the glory. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. His name is to be glorified. His power is to be noted. His praise is to be made because the glory belongs to the one who is all powerful, all knowing, all wise, and who will save us. You know, Paul Tillich, the um, American German uh, philosopher and Lutheran theologian, wrote a passage that that I came across that really made me stop and think about why we don't praise more, why we don't thank God more for His goodness. The human nature inside of us, maybe, maybe, maybe this, uh, this 
theologian is onto something. Let me share with you. The reason most of us do not respond to thank you or do not say thank you is because we instinctively realize that it makes us somehow dependent on that person. If I thank you, I am saying that I am dependent on you, and I am publicly affirming it before God and people. Gratitude is an action that has its roots in grace. The free, undeserved love action of God. When we are truly grateful, we become starkly aware that we are wholly dependent for everything upon God and upon our fellow human beings who are made in His image. When we are truly grateful, we recognize that God has favored us, whether we deserve that favoring or not. That really made me think. Praise. Praise bears the soul of our self-righteousness, of our self-sufficiency. It is a recognition that we, know, we don't know what to do, as Jehoshaphat said, but God does. It is a recognition that we are weak, but He is strong. It is a recognition that we don't deserve this deliverance, that we can stand still and see, but that God is giving us these blessings simply because of who He is, simply because He is a great God. He is a God whose love endures forever. That's the reason God blesses His people. You know, the reason God has blessed your church, your family, this conference, your school, over the last years, not because we have great leaders, we've made good decisions, everything has been done the way, you know, the authorities or the, the experts, I should say, um, would, would tell us to do it. The reason we're blessed, friends, is because of who God is. God is an amazing God whose mercy, whose love endures forever. Those who live, those who choose to live in the atmosphere of heaven's grace are the most thankful and grateful and praise-filled people of all. You know, this reminds me of the story of Martin Rinkert. Martin Rinkert did not have an easy life. He was born in, um, uh, I guess what would be considered Germany, um, a, a, fa a poor family. His parents were just peasants in the year 1586. His father was a coppersmith by trade and could not afford to send him to school. At the age of 14, Rinkert used his musical talents to gain a scholarship as a foundation scholar and chorister at the St. Thomas School in Leipzig. And this scholarship allowed him to pursue his lifelong dream of becoming a theologian, a pastor. In time, uh, Martin Rinkert would return as pastor of the parish in Eilenburg, where he had been born and raised. But if attaining his dream of an education had been difficult, young Martin's ministry would be anything but easy. As he arrived in Eilenburg, the Thirty-Year War was beginning, and Eilenburg was in the district that was caught between the two powers from the north and the south, the disputed territory. He endured the abuse of the invading soldiers, was forced to provide housing for them in his own home, often found his scant store of provisions and food plundered, and yet constantly tried to uh, assist the stream of needy who gathered outside his door. Thousands of refugees from the surrounding countryside fled into the walled city of Eilenburg for safety. And these refugees only added to the burden for this pastor and his young family. 
provisions were so low that some historians record that 30 or 40 persons would sometimes be involved in an all-out brawl in the streets over the body of a dead cat or crow. It was desperate times. And for years, Martin Rinkert ministered through these obstacles. Then, as if it weren't bad enough, the plague hit. An epidemic of disease that struck one after another. It, it affected the community of Eilenburg particularly hard. As disease ravaged the city that was already overwhelmed by war and famine, Martin soon found himself the only pastor in the city still living. In 1637, in that one year alone, he conducted more than 4,000 funerals, including the funeral of his wife. He would hold more than as many as 50 funerals in a single day. Only three of the city council survived the disease. And Rinkert, along with the burgomaster and one other citizen, along with these three council members, were left providing leadership and assistance to the devastated population. In the middle of all this tragedy, the Swedish occupying forces demanded a tribute of 30,000 thalers from the city. Rinkert went with a group of his people and the other leaders, and he went to that general and he interceded for his helpless people, but found the general to be unmoved by their pleas for mercy. So in the presence of this general, Martin turned to his members and he said, Come, my children, we can find no mercy with man. Let us take refuge with God. Right there in front of the general, they knelt in prayer. After which, he led them in singing a familiar hymn. The general was touched by their genuine faith and lowered the tribute from 30000 to 2000 dollars. Now, some might ask the question, what was the secret of Martin Rinkert's incredible strength through difficult, sacrificial years of ministry? His unwavering faith, no doubt, his um, belief in God and his word, unquestionably. But what strikes me about Rinkert is his uncanny, almost unbelievable spirit of gratitude and worship. He wrote 66 hymns, and one of them stands out still today as one of the greatest hymns of all time. Next to Martin Luther's, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, Rinkert's Nundanket Allegat is the most widely sung hymn in Germany, the homeland of Protestant music. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices who wondrous things has done in whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's, uh, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. Oh, may this bounteous God through all our life be near us, with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us, and keep us in His grace, and guide us when perplexed, and free us from all ills in this world and the next. All praise and thanks to God the Father now be given, the Son and Him who reigns with them in highest heaven, the one eternal God whom, whom earth and heaven adore. For thus it was is now, and shall be evermore. When you read these words, you might think they were written by a person who was blessed with plenty and abundance. But his life is a testimony to the truth that greatness comes not from a life of ease, 
nor a spirit of appreciation from the enjoyment of plenty. It comes from keeping the spirit of praise and of gratitude of who God is and of His grace alive in our hearts. I don't know about you, friend, tonight, but my heart is inspired when I read these stories. The story of Jehoshaphat, who remembered the power of praise, who was willing to listen to the prophets, who was willing to position himself in obedience to God's word, to where he could be blessed, and finally who filled even times of adversity with praise and thanksgiving. Men like Martin Rinkert, who, if you read his hymns, you never knew he saw trouble, because all he did was focus on the one who could save him from his troubles. Maybe tonight, with Jehoshaphat, we need to We need to start by praying a prayer, a prayer of confession, of praise. Yes, God is still on the throne. Praise God. He has blessed us. He he can save us. All might and power are His. All wisdom and knowledge are His. A prayer of confession that we don't have the power. We don't have the answers. And a prayer of submission that our eyes are on you, our Savior, our King. Is that the kind of prayer you want to pray tonight? Is that what kind of experience you want to have? An experience of praise and of gratitude. I would invite you to pray with me wherever you are. Just bow your heads and we'll pray that prayer to our, our God and our King right now. Father in heaven, these stories inspire my heart and mind. They, they show me how easily I get discouraged and, and uh, disturbed by, by the obstacles that I face in my life, in my work, in my own heart. These, uh, these stories remind me, though, Lord, that, that you still work in behalf of your people. So I just want to pray today that you would help us each one to experience the secrets of joy-filled living that Martin Rinkert experienced, that we might pray tonight together, here together, collectively, that prayer that Jehoshaphat prayed. You are an amazing God. You have done great things. You, You have brought us through the last year when we didn't have any answers and didn't know where to turn. You, Lord, are a mighty God. We are weak. We don't have those answers but you do. So today, Father, I just want to pray. Like Jehoshaphat did, I want to say that our eyes are on you. We want to turn to you for answers. We want to turn to you as we praise you and uplift your name. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. May that be our refrain. May that be our our response. When we see Not only the good things that have happened, but also the challenges that still lay ahead. Be near us as we seek to follow these principles in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.